So the next phase of my life was arriving at RLI, at one commando, who were, already, who were deployed in the Mount Darwin area and had just come out of the day, what they call the day of the 28th in one commando, where um, uh, Pete White, uh, who is an acting sergeant, was killed. Um, um, and a few other guys, um, Diedrichs and whatever. And it was a sad occasion that his mother was on the um, radio and it went through the, and, and, and the OC asked, uh, was reporting that um, her son had died as a normal citrate before the mother was actually confronted and told about it. She had to hear this over the phone. It was rather a sad, but quite a blunder, a PR blunder in my book. It was that, but fundamentally, the commando went through a tremendous, uh, Harry Springer mentioned it to me. He said they were in a tremendous mess as far as morale and, and whatever was concerned. Because the thing about Pete White was I had a special relationship uh, with with Pete White because Pete White was at school with me and he was a junior at my high school in Sonoya and he was my skivvy because in the fifth form we were allowed to have skivvies at high school like most Rhodesian schools had where they had to polish your shoes and make your bed or whatever. It was years later when I was the troop sergeant in two troop that this apparition appeared in the doorway of the IS store which happened to be my office um, there, and he said, "Ah, oh, Sergeant, I know you from Sonoya High School." And he said, "I was your skivvy at high school." And I said to him, "Guess what?" <laughs> now he became my skivvy <laughs> army because he was the most junior recruit in the commando in the troop. But he was a very, very good soldier. But he also um, a typical bush bush sort of soldier. Um, I just had to mention that because. Um, uh, that was a very sad occasion. I took over from a commander that had been denuded, and it was it wasn't a very pleasant meeting when I eventually went out to Mount Darwin to join the commando there. But I vowed and declared that I was going to turn that around because the we men's welfare and everything were mine. I had a bit of a hard task um, uh, to start with because I had to find out exactly how the men felt. And whatever, and why did they feel like the way they did, and whatever? And things were controlled to me that I don't want to discuss, but that, but I got the feeling, and, I, and my work wasn't to criticize or deride, my job was to fix. So I went about fixing it. And one of the first things I tried to do was try and get the stick commander, whether he was a corporal or, a, or, or, or an officer, would allow me to take one of their troops place and of course that did not go very well and no Lance Corp wants the CSM looking over their shoulder because I suppose they said stop it now they looked out as though fighting the war was one way to get away from the senior ranks or whatever and they could they wanted and they were afraid that I would um, uh, somehow stymie uh, or change what they were used to doing. I managed to get into a few fire force operations. I think oh, George Dempster was one of the guys that when I, I was actually a stick commander, I, uh, the, the, the troop commander made me the stick commander of the stick. So I had a chance at being um, involved in a, as a commander of a fire force stick. And my major thing wasn't there to get any glory or hero. Of course, I enjoyed the adrenaline rush of the, the contact. But what I wanted to do was observe the, the, the actual. Okay, uh, Derek, um, we, we kind of gone well over our time. So I think, why don't you talk us through Op Marden and, and the attack on uh, Mavui? Yeah. Okay, briefly, um, there, there, Marden was a widespread um, operation into Mozambique. Um, in this sort of Tet area and south of Kabora Bassa, Zambezi, in that area, with the RLI, SAS, RAR, uh, all the units and RR, uh, Rhodesia Regiment units were involved um, in various operations to clear out that area of um, sanctuaries. Um, 
that were, were hosting the Zonla and Zipra forces in those camps. Um, and one commando was tasked with crossing the border and doing a night march into up to the Roya River. And that was about, I think it was about 15 to 20 kilometers from the border. And it was a camp uh, called Chikambedzi. And um, we walked in as a whole commando at night and we had some SAS um, guys who'd wreckied the camp. They were um, actually in the navigation team. Uh, um, and everything went well. But um, being the CSM of the commando, I thought that I had had experience of the map reading capabilities of some people. Some people don't have that 3D uh, vision to try and take an aerial view or a, a bird's eye view of where they are in relation to the ground. And there's always a possibility of getting not lost, but not knowing where you are. <laughs> okay. And it came at about two o'clock in the morning. And I I think I probably walked that distance three times because I was walking up and down the line a single file, um, just counting numbers and 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 making sure that um the guys still had their kit on them. Because there's always this order one has is that right when everybody arrives at the base plate that half the mortar bombs are missing because they've been dropped off and whatever. Um but um that's just being a suspicious sergeant major more than anything else, because it never happened. I can assure you of that, because that would have been a very serious offence. I would have not have smiled at any of that. And I had warned the guys up front that um, what you take with you now, you will have when you disperse at the Morgan base plate. Anyway, so um, I did that trip up and down, and it was the dark of the night. About two o'clock in the morning, I had a message to come to the front um, and the whole column had come to a halt and I went to up to the front um, where uh, the OC was in the riverbed with the navigation team and the OC said to me uh, Sergeant Major we don't know where we are the SAS can't establish exactly where we are and I said let me try something I tried to be diplomatic about this because I had been doing map reading all the way. So I sent one of the sergeants, um, in this I don't want to mention names because it's very sensitive. I sent a sergeant up to the right-hand side and I said, um, if I'm right, there should be a re-entrant coming in from the left, from the north. And I sent the other sergeant the other way down the, the, the this um, donga we were sitting in. And you should see a re-entrant coming in from the left around about 300 meters. They set off and they came back in the dark of the night and it was partially moonlit. And they said, yes. So I said, well, here we are. In fact, we were bang on. We were exactly where I said we should. And I remember um, uh, uh, the OC saying, my goodness, imagine having to report that we haven't got to our base plate and the artillery had started firing and the commander was not in position that would have been a hell of a blood burn i i don't think many officers and people would have survived that i mean so it it, it was a dire situation for the leadership of one commander that we had to get this right and we had so luckily we we forced the pace a bit and we got to the base plate because what we did base plate was just 60 millimeter mortars and, and, um, under the support commando guy very good guy um very skilled and, and experienced um who set up um the 60 millimeter mortar base plate where we decided to run the operation from um and then that was designated and then the stop groups dispersed from the base plate out encircling the camp and being dropped off around the camp and then the, the assault team would actually go in there um, which was one troop and that was where Rifleman Fenner or, or um, uh, Trooper Fenner was killed in that assault on the camp. The, the artillery fired and they fired a lot of air bursts 
<coughs> and you could see the puffs above the camp. And what the which had done, they'd had corrugated iron <coughs> roofs, but no sides. And the roofs were covered with branches and whatever. So they were well camouflaged from the air. And the Roya River around that area was quite thick bush. So it would have been hard to spot for any aircraft. That's why the ground recce was done, I understand. Anyway, it went in and 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 a lot of the occupants, terrorists, had apparently, I didn't actually get into the camp. Diarrhea, bad, 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 bad. Um, and the, uh, they were under all this rubble because the air burst had taken the, the roofs of these corrugates off the their mounts, so their, their, their pulp. The next thing I, I heard, now, this was pretty controversial. I was warned that there was an outbreak of cholera in the north of the country and that the possibility of the Roya River water being contaminated with cholera. And then I started with my vivid imagination putting two and two together and questioning that, okay, here's an explanation for those signs of very runny stomachs and diarrhea and whatever. I got a reminder from the, the boss to tell the guys not to drink the water. Now, in Mozambique, at that time of the year, I think the firing, uh, the, the, the H hour was 6.20 in the morning. So by 7 o'clock, the operation was over. But then the sun came down and the guys had spent all night and they had no water. Now, it was a case of needing the sergeant major for discipline to stop them. How was I going to stop people going down to the Royal River and filling up their water bottles um, and drinking that water? So um, when I was questioned, I had to give a very weak answer and said, there is possibly contaminated. Now, I leave the rest to everybody's imagination what could have happened there. But it was something that has haunted me for a long, long time. And it led to an incident at Salisbury Airport when I was about to leave Rhodesia for South Africa. Um, I still today believe in what I had seen and I had heard and I had been told. Um, and I put one and one together and I have my opinion and I'm not going to express it here publicly because it just could bring up some very serious issues, um, especially if it got into international press, for instance. We can't afford that. So it was a very, very a dicey situation. I actually think I know what happened, but once again, I'm, I say nothing. And I just want to close on that subject about chicken beds. We had to walk out to where we could be picked up. Some of us were picked up by helicopter, some of us, walked and got picked up um, by road transport, got in as far as we could. And eventually we got back to Mount Darwin. We arrived at Mount Darwin um, at about three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And that night we were all shunted off, still with our um, no time for shower, no time for anything. Just some good cold pilsners from um, or Sport Edwards, the cook. He used to look after us like that all through our Nyomasoto days and whatever. And we had cold beers and whatever. Then we were told that we had to embark immediately onto the Dakotas at the Fire Force base at Mount Darwin because we were going to Entirely, because Entirely had been attacked. So the whole commando embarked on the Dakotas nine, ten o'clock at night. And we are, uh, well, probably a little bit earlier. Uh, we arrived at. Um, Entirely, and we went up, I think it was for Independent Company, where we all arrived to go and sleep and whatever, and wait for our orders. Because what had happened was, is that Entirely came under fire from 122 millimeter rockets from Mozambique. And the RLI as a battalion was being gathered together to start operations immediately against around the Mozambique side of the border uh, to stop any desires that the Turs had on entering entirely. 
I was briefed, and I think I'm quite well um, spoken about this. They talk about which units were special forces unit. And I judged that the ROI, in fact, in 1970, became a special forces unit uh, because us to fight in a foreign country, which is not conventional forces type operations. Um, we had done that. And this occasion, I was briefed um, as a CSM commando that one of my tasks, and I could select a team <clears throat> where we would be dressed in Trinima uniforms, kitted out completely, and we were to go and, and take out a bridge between um, Villa Dominica and, and Amtali to prevent logistics supply to FAPLA on the main road, the uh, Vira Corridor Road. Um, and that was my task with the explosives and everything. And I hadn't practiced with the explosives for some time, but I, we were very well schooled by Ron Reed Daly when we were in um, in, in Australia. I knew how to take out a pylon. I knew how to take out a, a, a railway line or whatever. But because I was a CSM, I suppose they trusted me with the, the explosives. And we were to go in there and do that task. And then at the same time, take out any task of opportunity. Okay, so we had a broad brief. And I remember one of my, uh, a, a troopy that I selected called Marsh Ross. He said, sir, this is crazy. We're not even trained for this. I said, that's what we do now. We expected to do these things with, with uh, more, you know, with no question whatsoever. And nobody questioned it except Marsh Ross. And he said, do you think we can pull this off? I said, of course, for guys like you, we pull anything off. Okay, it's just that you just have to keep your aggression, your fighting spirit up, you know, and, and whatever. And I said, there's no difference than blowing up a bridge in, in Rhodesia it is in blowing up in one in Zambia or Mozambique. You just have to make sure you can get in and get out reasonably efficiently with no casualty. I said, that's my task. And my task is to make sure that we can lay the explosives sufficient enough to do the job. But it. If I'd done, if I'd been ordered to do that finally, and a lot of the other guys who were also given very different and differing tasks of recce and whatever, um, it would have caused major um, disruption. But it never came about for some unknown reason. It didn't come about. And so we stood down, and the next morning we were as bored as hell in four R R. And that night we were permitted to go to town in, in Umtali. And they had, I think it, it must have been a weekend night because they had a big dance on at this big hall. So myself and a few of the other men much junior to me, um, and especially my, my team that was going to go into Mozambique, we decided that we were going to go to this party because it was chicks there and we were going to bop the night away there so we did have transport so we'd already been into the mess and we'd already sank a few beers and i decided that there was a, a four rr's medic medical land rover was standing by and i managed to find the keys so we all bailed into this medic, no permission, nothing, into this medic Land Rover, and that was our company transport for the night. And um, we had a very good time at the thing, but it was time to go home. We didn't want to push on that because we were quite pissed. And um, I was driving on the way back to barracks. Every bollard, you know the bollard in the road, that lit up, and it had on a little island and whatever, and you either went left or right or whatever. Went up to the bollard, put it in four wheel drive, and rode over the bollard all the way back to four independent company. And big laugh and great fun as the bollard crashed over and was crashed under the land room. We got back to thing, and I was a sergeant major. And the next morning, I was hauled in by, I think it was Dave Scott Donovan, who said to me, The police are looking for you. I said, why me? They said, because there's a damaged Land Rover outside and it belongs to four independent company. And nobody in four independent company had the keys for that. Um, and the other thing is, he said, you stupid, really are stupid, Sergeant Mayor, because you left a trail of destruction 
from the the dons right the way back and led you to exactly where you finished off. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I was um, many months later. I was went back to Antali to face the charge of I think it was public vandalism or something. And um, I stood there in front of the magistrate. And as far as Dave Scott D, who is my defending officer in the magistrate's court, I was the, the biggest hero and one of the most wanted men in, in the Rhodesian army. Jeepers, he only blew my, and I landed up with a, a $30 fine um, and a wrap over the knuckles by the, the beak. Um, and that was the end of that. But somehow or other, I don't think that was wiped clean very quickly because the CSM should not have been involved in such behavior. But if you put it together nowadays, and I, I look at other antics that some officers and senior officers got up to and the behavior of some of them, it was far worse than what I did um, yeah. because the RLI never really got frowned at for their behavior. Uh, their, their their behavior because they felt that uh, that naughtiness was a way of letting off steam and things like that. They made every excuse under the sun so that we didn't go to jail because they couldn't afford a person out of a stick. We just didn't have the people. Yeah. So uh, we we really we felt like royal game. Let's and some of us took advantage of it. There was no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that was it. And then um, it wasn't much later after that, that we were bussed down to the border and told we were going in to assault Mavu. Mavu had, had been wrecked out and whatever, and it consisted of Fapla and Zalu were in that camp. And it was quite a well-established, and the camp had been there for a long time. It was a well-established camp, which gave me that idea because there was actually one of the guys was a had a Zambian driver's license on him, and there was indication that another guy in that camp, another enemy in the camp, was a um, a Tanzanian army sort of laborer type thing. So one could say it was possibly well known that it was there by the OAU. Um, anyway, the point is, I was choppered in with Dave Scott B as part of the assault group. And obviously, we put out our stop groups. But the SAS, I think, took on the artillery camp because of the heavy guns on the camp, the 12.7s and whatever. I think it was a 14.5 involved as well. But we, when we assaulted the camp, the, the Air Force had put their normal strike in. And when we assaulted the camp, the in the camp had already bombshell. Um, and some of them had bombshell individually as Marsh Rush. Um, encountered a sniper who was sitting in a tree trying to shoot at them. And there was a section um, on our left that got bogged down in dead ground, couldn't hit them and they couldn't hit either. So uh, fundamentally, if, if you got up or got up to take on the enemy, the chances you would have been shot because you were only about 10 meters away from each other. I think there was seven all lined up in that group. Um, Anyway, I went to try and outflank them on my own, which was silly, but I thought I could ac actually take them on by getting them in, into a um, infill, a typical military tactic, is outflank the, that team, and at least put down some fires, which would give that section time to leap over this mound and take on those. And that actually happened. But I was either shot at by the K car or because it was close call, the KCAR shot at anything that uh, in that war, in that battle at Mavu. And I felt all these bullets whizzing around my head. And I didn't know whether it was another group or whether it was my own guys or the KCAR. I didn't know. I just fired in that direction where I thought these guys were lying. And apparently I was quite good because they were able to leap over the mound and go forward from there. And we came across the entrenchment system that was full of water. The trenches were, a lot of them were half filled with water. And this guy with his nostrils was sticking out of the water. So I told one of the guys to jump. And he jumped on this guy on his chest. And this Zambian proved to be a Zambian army truck driver because he had a, a military license. 
from a near and 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 Zambian um, soldier. So, as I said, that's what led me to believe that you know this war had gone way beyond the borders of Mozambique and Mavu. It was right up towards the OAU and and whatever. So the escalation we really knew had already happened because, like we had the South Africans helping us at the end of the war, I think Tanzania, Zambia, and whatever were actually providing troops or at least logistics troops to uh, Fatma and Fredima. No, well, Fredima. Where, where is Mavu? It was ah, a good question. It was north of Mapai, um, opposite Malceta. Right. So we're talking well into Mozambique, uh, yes. uh, Zambian soldier. Yeah. So I think, you know, they were either transporting in and out because there was roads in and out. It was as though they didn't expect any attack, although they couldn't conceive that they were going to be attacked. But, uh, you know, most of these camps, as you know, they... They moved around in the local area quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> They'd abandon one sort of position and start up a new position somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and so, so it was on the other side of the Chimani Mani Mountains. Then. Yes, exactly. Yes. Anyway, that was our day. And then we, we came back and now is my time to decide whether I was going to stay or leave. And um, after I had told my missus about the attack on Mavu, she said, it's enough now. You've got two young daughters and whatever. Your service is up. Don't sign on again. Yeah. Um, so I made that decision, but I also made it against the background of a, um, we were having a few beers at Mount Darwin camp itself with the OC of the commando, the officers and the NCOs, senior NCOs. And the talk was on where Ian Smith had decided to accept black majority rule. So I was very, very disappointed because there was no chance that the person that we'd spent the last 10 years trying to kill was possibly going to become our the leader of our country and that I was going to have to serve. If I wanted a career in the army, and I'd have to serve under a person like that. So I said, I'm not even taking the chance because... If, the, if there is one man, one vote, there's only one conclusion. Not because it was, in my mind, they just weren't, simply just were not ready to govern. They made huge steps and they were brought out of the darkness into the modern era. But um, to have black majority rule um, at that stage of the game would, be, would have been ruinous to the country. So that's my political stance. And that was one of the reasons that I started giving up on a career in the Rhodesian Army. So when my dis when I left and I decided to leave, that was really the time I decided. But my push came to shove from my wife when we got back from Mavu. I just want to, to mention that um, I had three months leave pending discharge because there was no use me taking my full, because I was paid out cash for whatever pension monies were owed to me. And... Um, obviously, for the leave that I had not taken. So I was owed three months. So I got out, um, virtually cancelled my cancelled out my boy's service. And then we were only allowed $1,000 to come across the border. But six months before that, I had already secured a civilian position with the Standard Bank in Cape Town as their chief storeman. So I had a job to go to when I actually went to, to Cape Town. I'd already applied for a South African residence permit and was approved. So I had all my ducks in a row before I actually left the army, just in case I would going to leave. Um, so when the day came, I was waiting for my, my wife to come back from Johannesburg at Salisbury Airport. And I was sitting in the lounge bar. I had a beer. I was, it wasn't more than a beer. And the plane landed, um, but about after half an hour in the, in the pub, was confronted by some plainclothes policemen in the in the bar lounge on the on the first floor of the Salisbury Airport. And they said to me, "I must go with them." And I said, "What? What am I doing? What? Am I under arrest? Have I committed a traffic offence because I had a hired car 
at the airport that I was going to take my wife to the hotel before we flew back to South Africa the next day. Anyway, they hauled me off downstairs to this room, an interrogation room. I asked them what the charges in that were. They wouldn't tell me anything. The next thing, I was bundled off. And I was I managed to tell the, uh, the, uh, the one of the airport officials, a nice young lady, that when Shirley Collins arrived, I gave her the keys for the hired car. And, and I told her that we were staying at the Oasis Hotel in Salisbury and that she should take the car. She had a license, everything, and go and stay there. And I would contact her as soon as I could. They bundled me off overnight into the cells in Salisbury Central uh, downstairs. And I still didn't know what was going on. The very next morning, around about nine o'clock, there was great hassling and rattling of keys. And I was taken up to an office with no escort, nothing. Uh, they escorted, they took me to the office and I opened the door. And there was, I knew it was an, a, a special branch guy um, because I had seen this face somewhere before. And I think it was possibly in Mandura at the, uh, close to the, uh, the jock in Mandura. And I seemed to recognize in me because he knew me. He'd obviously done his homework. And I said, I still don't know what I'm being charged with. He said, well, we're not charging you, but we're giving you a warning that you know certain things that you are still held by the Official Secrets Act. And I said, what are they? And they wouldn't tell me. So guess what? This imagination led back to the chicken beds you read. Anyway, I had an inkling that it may be that, um, and that perhaps I'd spoken out of turn somewhere and somebody had reported me. Um, I didn't know, but I didn't speak about it in general, but I did tell my wife, and there was other guys in the my commando that knew my stance on it. So anybody could have reported me and that I was leaving the country. Anyway, so this guy said to me, you still under the official secrets act. If you talk about this for the next 30 years, you are in trouble. I said, but I don't know what I've done wrong. And I said, would you kindly get hold of a guy like uh, Bruce Snellgar, who was my troop commander, or, or Neil Creel, or whatever, who can vouch for me and get me out of here? Um, it so happened that in an hour's time, I was released and said, no, you can go. And that's the last I heard about it. So the, the military obviously got involved. Um, and uh, uh, this SB guy sort of changed his tack very quickly. Um, after receiving the phone call when I was in his office. Um, and he said, no, you can go. But he threatened me. He threatened me that they were they had the ability to call me up as a national uh, as a, a national service um, into uh, you know one of the, into the Rhodesia Regiment, for instance. Uh, they had the ability to call me up and they had the influence to cancel my uh, residence permit in South Africa. And that would have damaged my whole plans for the future and whatever. So I said, you don't have to worry about that. You're worrying about nothing. You've got a phobia. I told him, I said, you guys have got a phobia. You've been with this too close for too long. And you suspect everybody of being some sort of traitor or, or, or enemy. Um, I was actually very, I got cross. I really did. And I think I told him to F off eventually. But I got out of there and I left and we, I went to South Africa. And I told my wife about this and she grabbed hold of my greens and all my medals and all my stuff and burnt it on a fire. Because she said, if they can treat you like that, how many others? How many others were there? I mean, how many other people didn't they trust? And who was really running the show? I mean, I, I, I didn't mind because I got stuck into my civilian career straight away. And that's where my military career came to an end, uh, John. The next stage of my life was my civil life after that. Yeah, but yeah. briefly, I, I'll just get past that quickly, um, if you don't mind. Um, I landed up in 2004 after running my own business in, 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 in uh, leaving. I left uh, the Standard Bank after uh, four, four years. I joined Colton Paper, rose to Dizzy Ranks of National Logistics Manager. Yeah. 
went to university for five years, uh, Vitz, Tuckies, and Rao. I then um, left there and joined uh, Derek Taylor's Commando Security in Johannesburg as a general manager. Um, I left there, ran my own training establishment called All Africa College, where I actually had online training for, for, for um, mainly black security guards that could not make it to a training establishment because they were too yeah. far away. So I, I, I set up that, and it was all registered with the security office board. And it was a successful business because I moved into then employing <coughs> um, senior managers in security operations, um, uh, operations managers and so on. Similar to what security. Trevor Desfantum was doing. He had a yes. similar yes. setup. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I came into contact with uh, Titch Brotherton, who, I, by the way, I spoke to him last night on the phone for about an uh, hour okay. and a half. Um, because he was one of my in junior NCOs when I was a sergeant. Yeah. Um, so we, we had a nice chat. I dealt with him and his company. He ran a very, he's still running a very successful do with his son taking over. I spoke with Ian Bates, who was also in the industry. Um, okay. When we had conflict with the South African Special Forces trying to recruit um, uh, uh, regimental association members um, and using me as I think I was the chairman at one stage, operating out of commando security, um, and just for a brief period. And, and I consulted um, Ian in Johannesburg on that very issue and said, you know, this is what I believe is happening. And um, he, um, at his home, and we, uh, he seemed to understand, at least, yeah, that yeah. this was a, a, a great possibility. Anyway, so... Um, that was my career. Then I left, uh, offered a position by Ted Mallon, who is an ex-senior uh, um, senior superintendent in the BSAP, who runs the biggest who ran the biggest security company um, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, he was having problems with management um, because he uh, most of his guard force were ex-combatants, okay? And his management team were ex Rhodesian soldiers, but there wasn't a hell of a selection left. <laughs> They'd all disappeared. So he was left with a dilemma, and he he actually asked me to get one of his companies up and running and then uh, take over his newly created company. Um, uh, it was Safeguard, by Safeguard High Tech, and it was an integrated security management system company that would take on the large contracts because um, Zisco, before they had their virtual mutiny there, um, when it was had a completely board of black um, entrepreneurs, very good guys, and I was to do their whole um, security management system for them, from cameras to to to, to uh, guards and dogs and and yeah. so, on. Um, and I presented a plan, and when my plan was about to be approved by the board. This bloody Korean walks into the meeting and said, stop, 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 with a big smile on his face. He said, don't deal with this man. He's one of the enemy. So who was controlling the issue? Yeah, who was controlling Zisco at that stage? Because unfortunately, the, 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 the managing director um, spoke to me after that, and he did apologize. And he said, we loved your plan. We loved this. No, and he wrote to Ted Mellon to tell him exactly this. And he said, <coughs> but... Our financiers, you know who they are. Yeah, yeah. So whether he agreed or not, he was probably looking after his own position because obviously he didn't yeah. get paid a lot of money. He got paid a lot of money. Then I came to England. I rose to the uh, dizzy ranks of the um, um, head of quality for an a large aviation company, the okay. Worldwide Group Director. Um, I traveled to 83 different countries in the world, yeah. including... Um, Hanoi, Vietnam, Vietnam Airlines, uh, uh, Shanghai, uh, Boeing in Shanghai, um, and Aeroflot in St. Petersburg, and mainly the United States um, in Miami, uh, Texas, and um, California. Um, so I had a, an illustrious career with them. I left because I, it made me very sick. Um, and I just had to give up all the travel. And without the travel, I was dead in the water. I couldn't do my job. So I actually retired at the age of 68. 
I ran my own business for a couple of years, um, all very successful. I kept it small, kept it controllable. But at last, I was able to do what I wanted to do in my life for the very first time. Yeah. Well, Derek, thank you so much for your very interesting chat. And, um, you know, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it as an old RLI troopie, uh, hearing about, you know, the goings on of the uh, of the um, senior NCOs, um, because obviously as a troopie, we didn't have, you know, we weren't exposed to all of that stuff. But uh, but you've mentioned a lot of names that are very familiar to me, like uh, uh, like Chich Brotherton, etc. And uh, um, yeah, so I thoroughly enjoyed these interviews, and um, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for your time and effort and good luck with your future plans and whatever. And if I can help in any way, please don't hesitate to give me a 